Hi, and welcome to this introduction to DAP development. On this course, we will discuss the basic concepts of a DAP, how to build a basic DAP, and then introduce some more advanced concepts and explain how to integrate them into your DAP. I'll be your instructor. My name is Oli, and I'm the DAPS engineering lead here at Trilitech. I live in Brighton, and when I'm not programming, you'll usually find me swimming, cycling, running, or just enjoying the seaside and countryside. So, DAP, what does it mean? As you can see here, DAP stands for Decentralized Application. We're going to revisit exactly what this means in the next slide, but we should note the distinction of a DAP against what we would normally just call an app, where an app could be a web app, i.e. a website, or an app running on your phone, or a browser extension, or just a program that's running on your computer. The important thing to note is that a DAP doesn't have a backend, or to be specific, its backend code runs on a blockchain, which is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. Contrast this with an app, where the code, the backend code, is running on a centralized server, a server that you might have deployed to AWS, or might be running on your own computer or your company's computer. This is a centralized server, which is very different from a decentralized network, a blockchain. So at a high level, you can think of a DAP as a user-facing application to interact with the blockchain. In terms of appearances, many DAPs appear just like any normal app. So they can appear like a website or an app on your phone, as I've said, or something very similar. But as we've said, the difference is under the hood. The back end is completely different. It's running on the blockchain. One thing to note as well is that many existing dApps aren't completely decentralized. But as the transition from Web 2 to Web 3 continues, we'll see more and more apps becoming fully decentralized. So let's return to the concept of decentralized, which as we saw in the previous slide is the D in DAP. So again, to reiterate, what we think of as a regular app, a website or an app on your phone is very centralized. This means that the servers and databases are running in one or a small number of places and are owned, operated and managed by one or a small number of companies. So why is this important? Well, this takes us to the fundamentals of what Web3 and blockchain is really about. So let's say that you're using a regular web app, be that to interact with your bank, or maybe it's a social media um, website, or maybe it's an e-commerce website where you're buying some goods online. <clears throat> On these apps, you will enter certain personal information, maybe do some financial transactions. But what would happen if that company went bust? or if the government started censoring them. If this happened, then our data that was stored on that app's servers would suddenly go missing. We wouldn't have any control over it. Um, equally, if this company decided to do something malicious with our data, um, we wouldn't have control over it. We wouldn't be able to know that this was happening because all of our data was being processed and stored on these centralized servers that are owned and operated by a private company or, um, you know, or government or something like this. So the difference here um, with a DAP is that instead of our data being processed and stored on centralized servers, it's processed and stored in a peer-to-peer -peer network. So we have full control over our data. We can very easily see any code that is applied to our data um, because all code that runs on the blockchain is public and immutable. Um, and finally, the blockchain network itself is owned by no one, which is to say it's owned by everyone. And that means that it can't be censored by governments and equally a private company can't do whatever it wants to um, on the blockchain because they don't own it. It's owned by everyone. So um, returning to the bullet points on the slide itself, um, we can see that we've broken it down into four points that really kind of summarize what I was just saying. So with a DAP, um, the advantages are that no one can bring the service down. It has zero or very low maintenance and operational costs. Um, the security um, of your application is managed by the blockchain. The blockchain has built within it 
um, security protocols so you don't have to interact with external security and authentication applications and services. And finally, because there's no back end, that means that there's no data logging that might be going on that we're unaware of and no snooping, and that helps us maintain our privacy. There are, however, some trade-offs if you want to build a DAP instead of a regular app. The first one is that you have a high dependence on other services. Because, as we've mentioned, the, you don't have a backend with a DAP. Instead, the backend is code running on the blockchain. It means that you are therefore highly dependent on a blockchain, um, which isn't something that you will necessarily control. Um, also, because the Web3 movement is relatively new, um, there are certain conventions and um, a certain element of polish that hasn't quite reached all of the Web3 libraries and integrations. So you will sometimes find that your DAP might feel a little bit more clunky than it might do um, if it was a, a Web2 app. Um, but again, I'm sure while well, we have already seen huge improvements um, in the last one or two years. So um, the DAP libraries and functionality are certainly becoming a lot more smooth and less clunky. Um, the third one is that because you have a reliance on a blockchain, it means that you have to pay blockchain gas fees and also have to wait for block finality, which is um, a concept that we'll talk about a little bit more in the future, but is essentially you have to wait for your, when you write data to the blockchain, you have to wait a certain amount of time for that to be finalized. Um, now, as with everything, there's pros and cons on this. The fact that you're paying blockchain gas fees, um, you can maybe think of, well, what you're avoiding doing is maybe paying AWS fees for hosting your backend on AWS. So it's not a pure negative. Um, and then finally, you can't necessarily always iterate on smart contract code without serious implications. So smart contracts, again, this is a concept that we'll visit later, but that's essentially your backend code that is running on the blockchain. And um, if you find a bug or want to add a feature to your backend code in a regular app, this is often um, a relatively easy process. But when your code is on the blockchain, this can often be a little bit more cumbersome and difficult and in some cases impossible. So now that we've decided to build a DAP, there's maybe one more question. Why do we want to build our DAP on Tezos? So as the slides say, Tezos is an industry leading blockchain and it has a load of advantages over different blockchains, some of which we've listed here. So two of the main ones are the fact that it's designed to evolve which is not a feature that you see in most blockchains, and energy efficient. Um, so the fact that it's designed to evolve means that if the blockchain protocol needs to be updated to add new features, to make it more efficient, more cheap, um, on Tezos, this is a much, much easier process than you see on um, other blockchains. And it's extremely energy efficient. Tezos has been using the proof of stake consensus algorithm for a long time, which is one that's only recently been adopted by some other leading blockchains. And there's some blockchains that are still using the far less energy efficient proof of work. And then there's a few more advantages that I've listed here. The blockchain, uh, the block time, sorry, is very short, 15 seconds and dropping. It has extremely low gas fees. There's a wide range of compatible wallets and it has great developer support. And then finally, um, it supports JavaScript and Python-like languages for when writing smart contracts. And this can be really, really useful and helpful to people who are new to the Web3 development experience. Um, they can write their smart contracts, which is to say their backend code, in a language that's very familiar to a lot of developers. So, on to the final slide. And this is a little bit of an overview of the course. So what are we going to cover in the next 10 episodes? Well, episode one, that's the episode that we've just been doing, is an introduction to what is a DAP. And then in episode two, we're going to look at the architecture of a typical DAP and talk through each of these components piece by piece to get a good overview. Then in episode three, we are going to set up our, um, our DAP project. So that will be a Next.js application. Um, it'll be a relatively short episode. And if you have a lot of experience with Next.js, it's probably one that you can skim. 
And then um, in the subsequent episodes, from episode four to episode eight, we're going to be going through each of those um, architectural components that we did an overview of in episode two, but do a much deeper dive and see how we can integrate them into our DAP. So episode four, we're looking at wallets. Episode five, indexes. Episode six, smart contracts. Episode seven, uh, file storage. And episode eight will actually be um, sending operations to a blockchain node. And then in episodes 9 and 10, we'll be deploying our DAP and then looking at some best practices and do a little bit of a review of the course so far. So that's it for episode one. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you all in episode two.